Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Uh, we're very pleased to have a great keynote speech to start us off today, followed by an expert panel discussion. Uh, I should begin by, by thanking our, our sponsors. This event is made possible by support from the Foundation for EC Studies in Vietnam, uh, the Embassy of Japan, the Embassy of New Zealand, and general support for CSIS. Now, I don't want to eat too much into the keynote that I know so many people want to see, so let me just give a brief introduction to our speaker, and then I'll step back and throw it to Assistant Secretary uh, of State David Stilwell. So, David Stilwell is the Assistant Secretary for State for the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Prior to his appointment last June, he served in the Air Force for 35 years, retiring in 2015 uh, in the rank of Brigadier General as the Asia Advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. He previously served as a Defense Attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, among many other positions, and was most recently Director of the China Strategic Focus Group at the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command in Hawaii. Now, Assistant Secretary Stilwell is going to give us uh, about 20 minutes of remarks or so, and then we'll move into a Q&A the way this is going to work, uh, because we have so many people on, on the call, is that I would ask you to type any questions you have into the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and then we will select as many as we can, we'll try to get through as many as we can, and I will read them to the Assistant Secretary. So with that, uh, Assistant Secretary Stilwell, the floor is yours. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for the kind introduction, and, and especially thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation following a very important announcement uh, yesterday. Uh, I commend CSIS for regularly convening uh, leading thinkers on Indo-Pacific and on the South China Sea in particular. Uh, your work uh, is an invaluable resource to all of us. This is a timely and important discussion. In recent months, while the world is focused on the fight against the coronavirus, uh, the People's Republic of China has doubled down in its campaign to impose an order defined by might makes right in the South China Sea. Beijing is working uh, to undermine the sovereign rights of other coastal states and deny them access to offshore resources, resources that belong to those states, not to China. Beijing wants dominion for itself. It wants to replace international law with, uh, with rule by threats and coercion. In recent months, Beijing has sunk uh, Vietnamese fishing vessels. It sent an armed flotilla to harass Malaysian offshore energy exploration and wielded maritime militia to surround Philippine outposts. Beijing has further militarized its artificial islands in the Spratlys with new aircraft uh, deployments. It has announced unilateral fishing bans. It has conducted destabilizing military exercises in the contested waters around these disputed features. And it increasingly uses its artificial islands as basis for harassment operations to curtail access to Southeast Asian coastal states to offshore oil, gas, and fisheries. We all know, especially this group, we all know why this matters. By claiming indisputable sovereignty over an area larger than the Mediterranean and trampling the rights of others, Beijing threatens the existing order that has given Asia decades of prosperity. That order has been based on freedom and openness, ideas that Beijing imposes. Nearly $4 trillion in trade transit to South China Sea each year. More than 1 trillion of that is linked to US, the US market. The sea is home to an estimated $2.6 trillion in recoverable offshore oil and gas. It also has some of the world's richest fishing grounds that employ an estimated 3.7 million people in coastal Southeast Asian states. Almost 300 billion in US investment in the nations of Southeast Asia has helped to employ millions and build resilient, robust societies. These resources are the birthright of Southeast Asian nations, the lifeblood of their coastal communities, and the livelihood of millions of their citizens. They are the inheritance of each nation's children and grandchildren, and Beijing's behavior is an assault on the people of Southeast Asia today from generation to generation. So on this anniversary uh, of the tribunal ruling, this week marks that anniversary uh, as a historic statement on international law in the South China Sea, that being the 2016 arbitral tribunal ruling. This case of peaceful arbitration was brought and with real courage by the Philippines, and the verdict was unanimous. Beijing's nine-dash-line maritime claim has no basis in international law. 
The tribunal sided squarely with the Philippines on the bulk of its legal claims. Beijing has since tried to delegitimize and ignore the verdict, despite its obligations to abide by it uh, as a party to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Beijing likes to present itself as a champion of multilateralism and international institutions, but it has dismissed the verdict as nothing more than a piece of paper. Only the gullible or the co-opted can still credit Beijing's pretense of good global citizenship. Today, we are hearing more and more voices raised against Beijing's aggressiveness and its unilateralism. So we welcome the clear insistence last month by leaders of the Oz, uh, ASEAN nations that South China Sea disputes should be resolved on the basis of international law, including UNCLOS. The wider world is also speaking up and taking action in recognition that Beijing's actions pose the greatest threat to freedom of the seas anywhere on the planet. South China Sea issues have direct bearing on the future of the Arctic, Indian Ocean, the Mediterranean, and many other vital waterways. What is at stake in the South China Sea has a direct impact on every nation and person who relies on freedom of the seas and the free movement of maritime commerce to ensure their nation's prosperity. So our policy in the South China Sea. The United States has strengthened our policy and our approach uh, on the South China Sea. The policy is to champion a free and open Indo-Pacific in which all the region's diverse nations can live and prosper in peace. Our policy appreciates the diversity of those nations. It defends sovereignty, independence, and pluralism. A free and open Indo-Pacific means a region where countries are secure in their sovereignty and equal in their shared use of global commons. No hegemonic power dominates others or turns international waters into zones of exclusion. Our approach builds on America's long record in the Pacific of preserving the peace, upholding freedom of the seas in line with international law, maintaining the unimpeded flow of commerce, and supporting peaceful settlement of disputes. These are important and abiding interests we share with many of our allies and partners. In recent years, we have deepened our collaboration across the region. We have increased our maritime capacity building support for Southeast Asia partners. We've reaffirmed alliances and maintain a robust tempo of military activities to keep the peace. These include freedom of navigation operations, including five in the South China Sea so far this year, presence operations, including dual carrier ops earlier this month, strategic bomber patrols, and combined operations and exercises with our allies and partners. The United States continues to be the largest source of commercial investment in the region by far. Our nearly $300 billion in, in, in annual trade in goods and services with 650 million people of ASEAN help ensure the growing prosperity of the dynamic region. ASEAN nations now pr produce almost $3 trillion of annual GDP. Living standards have improved tremendously thanks to ASEAN's incredible energy and a global system that has long sustained stability, security, and prosperity. Yesterday, Secretary Pompeo announced an important step to strengthen our policy and to stand firmly with our Southeast Asian partners in defense of those sovereign rights. The Secretary has issued a statement of policy on maritime claims in the South China Sea on the occasion of the anniversary of the 2016 tribunal ruling. Since that ruling, we have said that it is final and legally binding on both parties, uh, China and the Philippines. This announcement goes further to make clear the PRC has no right to bully Southeast Asian states for their offshore resources. Specifics. Secretary Pompeo said three main things. First, the PRC has no lawful maritime claim vis-a-vis -vis Philippines over waters determined by the tribunal to be in the Philippines' exclusive economic zone or on its continental shelf. Within those areas, Beijing's harassment of Philippine fisheries and offshore energy development is unlawful as are any unilateral PRC actions to exploit those resources. Nor does the PRC have a legal claim to Mischief Reef or Second Thomas Shoal, both of which are under Philippine jurisdiction. Second, because Beijing has failed to put forth a lawful coherent maritime claim in the South China Sea, the United States rejects any PRC claim to waters beyond the 12 nautical mile territorial sea derived from islands it claims in the Spratly Islands. This means that the United States rejects any PRC maritime claim in waters surrounding Vanguard Bank off Vietnam, Deconia Shoals off Malaysia, Natuna Basar off Indonesia, uh, or in the waters of Brunei's EEZ. Any PRC action to harass other states' fishing or hydrocarbon development or to unilaterally carry out such activities on its own is unlawful, period. 
Third, the PRC has no lawful territorial or maritime claim to James Shoal off Malaysia. This one deserves a moment of study. James Shoal is a submerged feature on the seafloor some 20 meters beneath the surface. It is also only 50 nautical miles from Malaysia, and yet a thousand nautical miles from the Chinese mainland. Yet Beijing claims it as the southernmost point of China. That, that claim is absurd, appearing to derive from an erroneous old British atlas and a subsequent translation error suggesting the underwater shoal was actually a sandbank above the waves. But the fact is it isn't. And yet Beijing's propaganda touts James Shoal as PRC territory and PLA Navy ships deploy there to stage ostentatious oath swearing at ceremonies. International law is clear. An underwater feature gives no rights. James Shoal is not and never was Chinese territory, nor can Beijing assert any lawful maritime rights from such spurious claims. So in all these cases, the United States stands with our Southeast Asian allies and partners in upholding their sovereign rights and with all the rest of the law-abiding world in defending the freedom of the seas. As the sec Secretary said, the world cannot and will not allow Beijing to treat the South China Sea as its maritime empire. So let me briefly raise four other important aspects of the South China Sea issue. First, the role of Beijing's state-owned enterprises. Second, negotiations between China and ASEAN over a code of conduct. Third, Beijing's push for joint development of Southeast Asian resources. And fourth, Beijing's claim for a seat at the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. So on the first point, um, on state-owned enterprises, in the South China Sea as elsewhere, Beijing has used state-owned enterprises as tools of economic coercion and international abuse. They have been used to dredge, construct, and militarize the PRC's artificial island fortresses in the Spratlys, from which Beijing now violates the exclusive economic zones of Southeast Asian states. One of Beijing's leading infrastructure contractors that works all around the world, the China Construction and Communications Corporation, or CCCC, led the dredging for Beijing's South China Sea military bases with terribly destructive effects on the maritime environment and regional stability. State-owned enterprises have been used as battering rams to attempt to enforce Beijing's unlawful mine dash line. The China National Offshore Oil Corporation, or CNUC, uh, used its mammoth survey rig, HD-981, to try to intimidate Vietnam off the Paracel Islands in 2014. It is telling that CNUC's chief executive touted the oil rig as, quote, mobile national territory, unquote. The implications of such a statement should give pause to every nation that relies on the freedom of the seas for prosperity and security. Other PRC commercial survey ships and rigs have been sent repeatedly into Southeast Asian waters in which China has no rights. Numerous PRC-owned tourism, telecom, fisheries, and banking firms invest in ways to enable Beijing's unlawful claims and bullying. PRC fishing fleets in the South China Sea often operate as maritime militia under the direction of Chinese military harassing and intimidating others as a tool of violent state coercion. These state-owned enterprises are PRC instruments of abuse and we should highlight their improper behavior. We should also shine light on how these companies operate around the world, including across Southeast Asia and in the United States. In all of our societies, citizens deserve to know the differences between commercial enterprises and instruments of foreign state power. These state enterprises are modern day equivalents of the East India Company. Second, on code of conduct talks. There are clear red flags about Beijing's intentions. For years, Beijing has insisted that ASEAN states keep silent on their proceedings. Press reports have shown why. Behind closed doors, the PRC has pushed ASEAN states to accept limits on core matters of national interest. These include limits on who ASEAN states can partner with for military exercises and for offshore oil and gas work. Beijing is also pressuring ASEAN nations to cut ties with outside states and to dilute references to international law. These are the demands of a bully, not a friendly neighbor. Beijing may have backed off its arbitrary 2021 deadline for concluding the talks, but its hegemonic goals remain. The US, US interests are clearly at stake in the code of conduct process, as are those of all states who value freedom of the seas. The code of conduct in any, any way legitimates Beijing's reclamation, militarization, or unlawful maritime claims would be severely damaging and unacceptable for many nations. 
We urge greater transparency in the code of conduct process uh, to ensure a positive outcome that is fully consistent with the principles enshrined in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Third point, on joint development deals. The PRC seeks to dominate the South China Sea's oil and gas resources. To achieve this, Beijing is pursuing a campaign to deny Southeast Asian nation, uh, states access to desperately needed oil and gas resources, except through joint development. Uh, these deals that disadvantage smaller parties, that is, non-Chinese parties. The PRC gamut works like this. By aggressively deploying military forces, maritime militia, state-directed oil rigs, and the like, Beijing tries to drive up risk for energy for firms that want to operate in the South China Sea in hopes of pushing out foreign competition. Once accomplished, Beijing pushes other states to accept joint development with its own state-owned firm, saying, if you want to develop those resources off your coast, your only option is to do so with us. These are gangster tactics. The United States, the United States uh, supports nations in standing up for their sovereign rights and interests and in resisting pressure to accept any deal whereby the PRC pushes its way into a share of offshore resources that it has no right to claim. And then fourth, on the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, Beijing is running an uncontested candidate for the judge's position uh, on this tribunal at an election currently slated for August and early September. Like the arbitral tribunal that ruled against Beijing in 2016, the International Tribunal is established under the UN Convention of Law of the Sea. Electing a PRC official to this body is like hiring an arsonist to help run the fire department. We urge all countries involved in the upcoming international tribunal election to carefully assess the credentials of the PRC candidate and consider whether a PRC judge on the tribunal will help or hinder international maritime law. Given Beijing's record, I think the answer is clear. So these are all lessons uh, that apply well beyond the, the, in the region and well beyond into the Western Pacific. When Beijing uses coercion, empty promises, disinformation, contempt for rules, bad faith diplomacy, and other underhanded tactics in the South China Sea, it's drawing a playbook that it uses worldwide. We see it in the East China Sea and around Taiwan, where Beijing has expanded its maritime provocations and threatening sorties. We see it in the Himalayas, where Beijing recently took aggressive action on the frontiers with India. We see it along the Mekong River, where Beijing has used its massive cascade of dams to hold back water from downstream neighbors in Southeast Asia contributing to the worst drought in the Mekong's recorded history. I urge everyone to read the recent report from the Stimson Center uh, called New Evidence, How China Turned Off the Tap on the Mekong River. But Beijing's aggressive mode of operation is visible not only uh, in other disputes uh, over territory and natural resources, it is also visible in Hong Kong, very visible right now, where Beijing's new security law flouts its commitments under the Sino-British Joint Declaration in 1984, an agreement now derided by PRC officials as, quote, nothing but a scrap of paper. Just as they said about the 2016 arbitral ruling on the South China Sea. Aggressive behavior is Chinese general approach to international organizations. When the South China Sea came up at an ASEAN meeting in 2010, Beijing's top diplomat thundered at his uh, Southeast Asian counterparts, quote, China's big country, other countries are small countries, and that's just a fact, unquote. This sort of contempt helped explain uh, Beijing's subversion of international institutions from the World Health Organization to Interpol to the World Trade Organization and beyond. A few years ago, many believed that Beijing's South China Sea abuses were mostly a local phenomenon, a kind of limited indulgence for rising power finding its way in the world. Today, we know the Chinese Communist Party's neo-imperial ways aren't incidental to its character, but are essential features of a nationalist and marxist leninist mindset. Beijing wants to dominate its immediate neighborhood and eventually impose its will and its rules on your neighborhood too, wherever you may be. You could be a university student in Australia, a book publisher in Europe, or a general manager of an MBA franchise in Houston. You might work for an international hotel chain or a German car company or a US airline. You could be a 5G customer in Britain or anywhere else in the world. Wherever you are, Beijing increasingly wants to state claims, coerce, and control. By its nature, it cannot accept a pluralistic world with fundamental freedoms of choice and conscience. The South China Sea, then, is less a faraway exception and more a sign and a threat of how the Communist Party will seek to act, unless it faces resistance and pushback. 
So it is good to see a wide range of countries increasingly stand against Chinese abuses on a range of fronts, including the South China Sea. At the United Nations, a succession of formal declarations by Southeast Asia coastal states show a clear resolve to uphold international law and reject pressure to accept Chinese unlawful claims. These include Vietnam, Indonesia, and Malaysia in, the, in just the past few months. Likewise, the United States and other countries have raised concerns for the first time in the United, uh, UN Security Council and the General Assembly over the dangers of PRC actions in the South China Sea. Australia, Britain, France, Germany, and India have all recently issued statements of unprecedented concern over South China Sea activities by Beijing that put regional stability and international law at risk. Meantime, we see promising new defense and security arrangements among allies and partners from Australia to Southeast Asia, Japan, and India. As mentioned, all leaders of ASEAN last month insisted that South China Sea disputes be resolved on the basis of international law, including UNCLOS. So I will close by citing the statement put out Sunday by the Philippines on the fourth anniversary of the arbitral tribunal ruling. Quote, the arbitration case initiated and overwhelmingly won by the Republic of the Philippines versus the People's Republic of China is a contribution of great significance and consequence to the peaceful settlement of disputes in the South China Sea and to the peace and stability of the region at large. The Arbitral Tribunal's award of 12 July 2016 represents a victory, not just for the Philippines, but for the entire community of consistently law-abiding nations. For our part, the United States is resolved to protect our vital interests and those of our allies and friends. We are building our military capabilities. We are vigilant. We are exercising and operating wherever international law allows. We are strengthening ties with our friends. We stand ready to help bolster the military capabilities of concerned nations. We support multilateral diplomatic efforts to resist PR encroach PRC encroachments, and we are providing economic options to underscore that nations need not depend on initiatives from Beijing that are fundamentally predatory. The community of law-abiding nations will indeed stand together for a free and open South China Sea, a free and open Indo-Pacific, and a free and open world. I thank you for your time, and I certainly welcome your questions. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Stilwell. That was uh, an extremely helpful uh, discussion, I think, especially for this audience uh, who, who have been uh, hungry to hear more after the new policy position yesterday. I just want to throw out one question and then I'll get to, to the queue, which is filling up quickly. Uh, a lot of the, the chatter I heard last night were from journalists and experts saying, what exactly is different about this than prior US policy? Because it's clear, but I think for a lot of folks, this was implicit uh, in the US position before. How is this uh, an important shift? I would say primarily that we're no longer silent on the uh, maritime aspects of the UNCLOS ruling. We, uh, we acknowledged it, but then we didn't actually make any policy statements or adjustments. On it. And so what has changed is that the U.S. has made a uh, very more active uh, statement as to what this actually means. So those three points that I laid out that the Secretary pointed out yesterday uh, on, uh, again, specific maritime claims that have been um, debated uh, and fortunately claimant states and uh, ASEAN writ large have also taken a more positive approach to their own uh, sovereignty, their own uh, exclusive economic zones and the rights that derive from those. And so that's the point is where those overlapping claims uh, exist. We're stating that uh, we side with international law and that uh, we are working with those um, allies, partners, like-minded, not just in the region, but everywhere else. Uh, to support that. Thank you. All right, let's let's hop into the queue, which I can already tell we're not going to get to all these questions, but I'll try to bundle some and, and we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, if anybody is going to add an additional question, I'd ask, please identify yourself and your institution. I should have said this in the intro, and I'll, I'll do my best to guess for those I recognize. Let's start with Bonnie Glazer, my colleague here at CSIS. Bonnie asks, what will the shift in U.S. policy announced by Secretary Pompeo yesterday enable the U.S. to do that it previously was not able to do to push back against Chinese harassment and intimidation of its neighbors? Well, for one thing, we, we're no longer going to say that we're neutral or we take no position on these maritime issues. And so when a uh, drilling rig is planted uh, in Malaysian waters or in you know, Vanguard Bank in Vietnam waters or in Philippine waters, um, we can actually then take a, a positive statement. Uh, and 
they're, they're, they're physical, physical uh, demonstrations of support. And you've seen those from uh, the Defense Department in terms of uh, increased presence, phone ops, uh, recently carriers. Those are things we can do, but I'd, I'd like to take everybody off of that. You know, going back to my previous life, uh, yeah, I mean, that's how I saw demonstrations of support. But rhetorical support and gathering like minded to stand up, encouraging, giving them space to actually uh, insist on their UN, uh, you know, the agreement, the rights that came from these agreements, has great power and, and, and great effect. Also, by pointing out the differences between Chinese claims and what the rest of the world agrees on, um, and we can talk about Hong Kong and other things later, just by simply pointing those things out. Again, uh, enables others to stand up for their own uh, um, interest rights. So, you want to talk about visible demonstrative? We can talk to DOD and we can talk to the, uh, you know their activities. But again, from where I sit here in the diplomacy world, you know, words have very uh, they're very powerful. I mean, in the think tank world, you know that a good idea uh, can change lots of things. And so, this is an idea that's long overdue, uh, and that we're really happy to. Uh, Hold okay, let, let me try to bundle uh, two questions, one by uh, Admiral Mike McDevitt at CNA, and then the other from Richard Haydarian, one of our panelists here today. So uh, Admiral McDevitt asked what this policy will mean for U.S. policy around Scarborough Shoal, which is specifically called out in, in the policy statement yesterday. And Richard asked whether it'll have any impact on application of the Mutual Defense Treaty at places like Scarborough or Second Thomas, which is also called out in the statement. That's, uh, I mean, I mean that, that's so obvious and a very important question. Um, let me just note that, uh, well, I guess I'm gonna, the language in this is really important. So let me just give you the language on this. So this policy change is about maritime claims that were within the scope of the arbitral ruling filed by the Philippines, uh, which addressed maritime claims in the South China Sea. And so with respect to the Spratleys and Scarborough, the decision clearly provided that the PRC cannot lawfully assert a maritime claim vis-a-vis -vis the Philippines in areas that the tribunal found to be in the Philippines EEZ or on its continental shelf. The United States does not take a position on competing territories, territorial sovereignty claims over disputed land features in the South China Sea. However, we have made very clear our opposition to any PRC harassment of the Philippines or any other nation in the South China Sea. At Scarborough specifically, we have made equally clear our opposition to any PRC efforts to block access to Philip PRC fishermen uh, and any move by Beijing to physically occupy, conduct reclamation at, or militarize Scarborough. In March of last year, Secretary Pompeo also made clear that as the South China Sea is part of the Pacific, any armed attack on the Philippines forces, aircraft, or public vessels in the South China Sea will trigger mutual defense obligation under Article 4 of our Mutual Defense Treaty. Again, I'm the language is very important here, so I want to make sure I get that absolute story. So, just to clarify, any move by the PRC to physically occupy, reclaim, or militarize Scarborough Shoal would be a dangerous move on the on the part of the PRC, and would have lasting and severe consequences for the PRC's relationship with the United States as well as the entire region. Uh, so, I think that's pretty clear. As uh, you know, long string of uh, statements on the on the uh, alliance mutual defense treaty and specifically on Scarborough, which as we know was the center of attention for quite a while uh, in that standoff. Thanks. We have basically the same question from Tim Keating and, and Jan Weinberg, and, and I think it's timely since you ended your talk referencing uh, ITLOS, the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea. So they ask, should the United States join UNCLOS? I'm not a Navy guy, but I uh, worked would say too long with the Navy. No offense, Admiral McDevitt. Um, you know, these are, these policies derive from decades and centuries of operations on the high seas, on, you know, movement of goods and services, on commerce, and all those things that happened in the global commons. You know, we didn't call them that 100 years ago, but th this is what it is, right? You have things that you can claim, you have things that you have interest in, and then there's just massive space where you you operate the law of the sea you know by my reading and talking to my navy friends was derived uh, in large part from what the u.s and like-minded uk and others had come to accept as the rules of the road for um, 
moving around and, and, and uh, in commerce and military operations, all those things. These were understood. And so challenges to those uh, don't make a lot of sense. And my point there is the U.S. wrote those rules and we certainly abide by them through things like cull regs and ICSI and all these other uh, similar uh, documents that derive from that. I'm not going to go into treaty ratification. You guys all know the ins and outs of that. Um, that that's way beyond my purview. But I, I would just point out that the U.S. has been a very strong, consistent supporter of the tenets uh, the principles that are uh, in the law of the city. You know, just like you have to have traffic rules you know, on our streets, you have to have uh, rules of the road. Uh, in, you know, the most important uh, medium for international commerce and uh, interaction, which would be the maritime sphere. Again, hard for me to say as an Air Force guy, but I've learned. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from Paul M, uh, which is, what role does Europe play in the Indo-Pacific? And let me sharpen that and say specifically regarding the South China Sea. Europe. Yes. OK. Um, again, I'll go back to my Indo-PACOM recent experience. Uh, the French have a presence, a uh, military presence uh, in uh, Polynesia. Uh, they also have great interest in, in that movement. The UK has come on board and noted that uh, free movement through the South China Sea is, is important. Uh, we've uh, interacted with not just Europeans, but other uh, regional friends and, and partners, um, Australia and New uh, Zealand. So we all have an interest in peaceful resolution of disputes, and we all have interest in helping Beijing understand that. Not just in the South China Sea, but as I said in the presentation, globally, the, I, I mean, I gotta say the irony of Chinese position on, on the Arctic and the South China Sea, they're, they're diametrically opposed, despite the fact that they're almost the exact same issue. Uh, read the statements on their position on the Arctic uh, and then juxtapose that with, again, the South China Sea. And I think it's clear that we all have interests in, in movement through the Arctic and peaceful resolution of those concerns and everywhere else. So yeah, Europe definitely has a role to play. Thanks. We have a similar question from Ayan Kartik on India. What role does India play in the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy and here in the South China Sea? 1.3 billion people, uh, a massive democracy, uh, clearly interested in also standing up for its own maritime interests and other territorial interests uh, recently. The name change in 2017, I think it was 18, to Indo-Pacific was not by accident. Uh, that was uh, intentional to make sure that we make sure that there is a continuity from uh, all those waters through the Indian Ocean that transitions from the South China Sea into the Pacific. Uh, India is, uh, been, has been very um, positive on these changes and has been increasingly uh, showing interest in participating in a, a group effort. And, and let me just take the opportunity here to note, China is gonna try to spin this as the US versus China. That works in their, in their world, right? Because that, that allows others to stand off the side and say, well, it's just their problem. That, that just doesn't flow anymore. And, you know, and increasingly you're seeing uh, the world is, is standing up uh, and, and singing in harmony on these issues uh, to say that, that the, the Chinese version and, and policy and actions are, you know, we all, we all resist that. The recent ASEAN statements have been very encouraging and, uh, and, and for good reason. So standing together on this will send a very clear message in, in Beijing that the, all we ask is that you live up to your commitments on the Hong Kong on the joint declaration, on the WHO, WTO, I mean, the list goes on and on. You just can't sign papers and then walk away from them. You can't take the short-term you know, virtue of being a signatory and then ignore it. Those things are binding. Those are about credibility and legitimacy and they're about building trust and keeping faith. And you know, we're gonna continue to point that out and we encourage our friends and allies uh, and, and India is a huge part of that to, to continue to uh, voice that concern. Thank you. Uh, I want to be uh, conscious of your time. Maybe we can squeeze in two more short questions. Um, sure. So first we have uh, John Rennie Short from the University of Maryland. 
who picking up on, on some of your comments about Chinese SOEs asks any possibility of sanctions against officials or SOEs involved in coercion in the South China Sea, similar to those recently announced for PRC officials in Xinjiang? Uh, nothing's off the table. Uh, I would point out that the, the CCCC is responsible for untold environmental damage, not just in the South China Sea, but in other places. And being an SOE, is, actions are directed by, um, in this case, the Chinese Communist Party. So absolutely, there is room for that. Uh, we would encourage others. Uh, I mean, there are many aspects of the South China Sea that are worth to pers worth pursuing. We hope that this announcement gives others space to do that. I really hope that the folks that are very uh, interested, rightfully so, in the environmental damage I mean, on a massive scale of undersea reefs, fisheries, and all those things uh, would, be, you know, find their voice and, and also resist uh, this sort of activity. It hasn't, you know, it, it can't continue. So yes, um, there is room for that. And this is a language Chinese understand, this demonstrative and, and tangible action. Thank you. And let's let's give the last word to Kinsaku Watanabe, who asks, are you concerned about increased likelihood of armed conflict in the area because of this announcement? And go back to my um, previous jobs in military routes, of, co of course, uh, we keep that as a, a concern, but what we're doing is simply enforcing existing law. This is not, should not be seen as somehow provocative or, uh, you know, anything other than insisting that the PRC live up to its claims and its its agreements and all those. So this is, is you know, I've said in the past, this is housekeeping. These are things that we should have done for a long time, but uh, for, you know, rightfully, I mean, Personally, you know, I was of that school that we could work with these folks, right? Um, but my epiphany came 10 years ago when I went to Beijing and, and saw it and worked with them firsthand. And so we're going to have to take a more stronger, a stronger and more principled approach. We're going to have to address these excesses and these um, violations and gray zone uh, operations as they pop up. We can't get them all at once, so we're going after the most important, uh, you know, as we can. We will continue to do this, but this is not somehow trying to, you know, um, but this is nothing other than asking them to do what they said they would do. I, I can't see how they would take that uh, in any other way as, um, you know, as they would say, rectification of names, a very Confucian idea that Matt Pottinger clearly stated at the embassy uh, New Year's Day uh, celebration two or three years ago. We're simply making words and deeds match, uh, and that's pretty straightforward. Well, thank you very much. I will end there. I think we have another 40 questions in the queue that we didn't get to, uh, but there's, there's plenty of time moving forward. And uh, normally I would ask everybody to join me in, in a round of applause. Zoom doesn't make that impossible. I will assume that there's thunderous applause for Assistant Secretary Stillwell, uh, and we'll let you uh, move on. Well, thank if you, you have much. questions, you know where I live, right? So <laughs> I, I look forward to further interaction. Thanks, Thank Greg. you. Uh, now, normally this would be when we have a coffee break. It's on Zoom. If anybody wants to run and get a coffee, we won't know. It'll be okay. We're going to move straight into our expert panel. And let me start by highlighting that because of the unique circumstances we all find ourselves in amid the pandemic, we've decided to break what would normally be a whole day conference into a series of panels over several months. This will be the first of those. We'll have another expert panel to follow next month and the month after, and the last will likely be in October. Uh, who knows what the world's gonna look like by October, but for now, let me introduce our first three speakers who are gonna talk about the state of the South China Sea today. And I uh, fully recognize that they all got a surprise dropped on them yesterday with the new policy from the State Department. So this panel may have had to shift uh, their talking points overnight, and I apologize. So first, we're just going to go in alphabetical order. We'll have Richard Hedarian. Uh, Richard is the resident political analyst at GMA Network, which is one of the largest broadcasters in the Philippines. His latest book is The Rise of Duterte, a Populist Revolt Against Elite Democracy. Richard previously taught at De La Salle and Ateneo uh, de Manila University in Manila and was a research fellow at National Chungchi University in Taiwan. Then we'll have Dr. Nong Hong. Uh, Nong is the executive director and a senior fellow with the Institute of China-America Studies in Washington. 
She's also a research fellow with the National Institute for South China Sea Studies in Hainan. And she was previously an Itlos Nippon Fellow for International Dispute Settlement and a visiting fellow at the Center for of Oceans Law and Policy at the University of Virginia and the Max Planck Institute. And then we'll close out with Dr. Wen Hong Son, who is the Director General and Head of the Institute for the South China Sea uh, at the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. Prior to this, he was the Deputy Director General of the Institute for Strategic Studies at DAV. Previous postings in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, included in Stockholm and in Ottawa, and with the ASEAN desk at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And so without further ado, let me uh, throw it to Richard Haydarian to start off our conversation. Richard. Thank you very much, Greg, for that. Just, uh, just a quick uh, factual correction. My latest book is actually this one, The Indo-Pacific. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to flash it because I don't have time to go through some of the discussions. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm glad to be back again and to be the inaugural speaker of the inaugural series of the inaugural webinar on the South China Sea uh, Conference with the CSIS. Uh, so today what I'll try to discuss is macro-meso and macro-level discussion of the South China Sea. Let me first uh, begin uh, with the Philippines, the perspective of the Philippines, because much has been happening over the past few months. And of course, we have consistently written on that. So you can check my writings on that issue. Well, President Duterte has been consistently talking about his independent foreign policy. Uh, and somehow that meant less of US and more of China, or some would call it pivot to China. And critics have you know, tried to portray him as a Manchurian candidate or a Chinese governor in Manila. But I think what's even more interesting is independent from Duterte foreign policy. When you look at the statements that come out from top officials in the government, in fact, over the past year or so, if you look at the foreign secretary of the Philippines, his third foreign secretary, uh, Teddy Boy Loxin, and the defense minister, uh, uh, Secretary Lorenzana, the Loxin Lorenzana duo have been very consistent about their increasingly critical stance about what's happening in the South China Sea, which is remarkably different from what you tend to hear from President Duterte or previous foreign secretaries of the Philippines or other officials who are within the inner circle of the president. So I think that's something very important to keep in mind. And I think the other thing that we're also looking at right now is perhaps you could say that this is where we're seeing also the end of the potential honeymoon between the Philippines or President Duterte and China. I mean, over the past four years, I mean, President Duterte is already in his fifth year in office. Uh, China's promises of large-scale infrastructure investments, so far as I check, there are zero Chinese infrastructure, big ticket infrastructure investments in the Philippines. President Duterte was hoping to get major concessions from China in the South China Sea, particularly in the Scarborough Shoal, including hopes for getting some sort of a marine sanctuary and other sorts of concessions to allow for the Filipino fishermen to have easier access to the lagoon. But things have not been going well. And if you follow the news last year, of course, during the Reed Bank crisis, you had a suspected Chinese militia uh, ramming into a Filipino uh, fishing vessel and almost more than 22 individuals Filipino almost died, if not for the Vietnamese fishermen who happened to be illegally within our waters, but good enough they were able to save our folks. So I think what really has forced President Duterte's hand uh, and has allowed for the, uh, the more China skeptics element within the defense establishment and within the foreign ministry to more dictate uh, what's happening in terms of Philippine foreign policy is clearly the Chinese brazenness in terms of its opportunism over the past few months. And you see this very explicitly reflected in the statements of no less than President Duterte himself in the recently con uh, concluded ASEAN summit whereby he said, essentially, in the midst of this pandemic, we're still seeing these very disturbing developments. And of course, he was, he was referring, to, among other things, the February incident when a uh, Chinese warship was suspected to point the radar uh, gun at the, uh, uh, at the Filipino warship. Not to mention, interestingly, the Philippine Department of Foreign Affairs in April released an unprecedented solidarity statement with Vietnam when a Vietnamese uh, fishing vessel was suspected to be sunk and two others apprehended uh, by the Chinese uh, uh, Coast Guard vessels. That was unprecedented. If you just look at the, the tenor and cadence of the statement, I've never seen anything like that coming out of the Department of Foreign Affairs. And then over the next few weeks, you have Secretary Luxin tweeting, kind of like Trump, in the most provocative way possible, threatening China with the severest consequences 
if they threaten the Philippine interests in the area. So I think those are very interesting things to keep in mind that instead of an independent foreign policy whereby we're moving away from the United States, you see more independent from Duterte's China-leaning uh, rhetoric policy when it comes to Philippines' actual uh, you know, uh, predisposition on the ground. And it's actually what's fascinating right now is, as everyone knows, in February, President Duterte made that unilateral decision, potentially unconstitutional, because he didn't get the, the uh, say of the Senate on this issue, to get rid of the visiting forces agreement. And the VFA with the US is extremely important because it's the software that allows for the hardware of our mutual defense treaty to apply, because it provides the legal framework for large scale entry of American troops in and out. Now, President Duterte reversed that decision uh, uh, towards early June. And obviously, you cannot separate that from what's happening there in the South China Sea. So over the next days, you saw the Philippine ambassador to the United States. You saw uh, Secretary Loxin. You saw many top officials in the Philippines making it very clear that the developments in the South China Sea were a major driver of that decision. Up until today, it's already July, middle of July, I've not heard from President any major statement on that issue. So that's something very interesting because that decision was supposed to be upon the president's instruction. So we're not really under, so we, it's hard to understand what's going on, but it's most likely a situation where the president's hands were forced by elements within the government who are saying, we cannot just, this is the worst time to initiate a strategic divorce with America, just when we're facing these kinds of unprecedented crisis and threats also in the South China. And that brings me to the second issue. You, know, you see, you know, of course, you know, there has been a lot of criticism of President Trump and the Trump administration on so many levels. But I think the fact of the matter is that many people have underestimated how there has been an improvement in terms of American commitment to its allies, especially on the South China Sea question over the past few years under the Trump administration. We see that, you know, over the past six months, the U.S. has conducted more fun ups than, what, three or four years under the Obama administration. And Greg and I, we have been all arguing that, of course, phone-ups alone is not enough, but it's, it's necessary as part of a bigger package of constraining China's worst instincts. We have also seen that foreign military financing to the Philippines actually doubled under the Trump administration. But I think most importantly, and this is where the Pompeo statement didn't come as complete shock to us, we don't see it as a kind of a cynical ploy during an election when Trump wants to look good by bashing China. We see it as a very, a very much logical progression in terms of the increasingly tough stance of U.S. in the South China Sea. And I think from the Philippine perspective, what really caught our attention was last year during March, during a press conference that Secretary Pompeo made in Manila, and he made a detour from the visit in Vietnam during the summit between Trump and, and Kim Jong-un. Um, he made it very clear, and this is the first time. I didn't see this in the documents during the Carter or Clinton administration, but definitely not during the Obama administration and Bush administration. He made it very clear that the mutual defense treaty will not just apply in the vague sense of the Pacific waters, but in the South China Sea. And he, and later on, Ambassador Sun Kim to the Philippines, also made it very clear that the mutual defense treaty will be applicable and activated potentially if the Philippines aircraft, vessels, and soldiers in the South China Sea, in the disputed areas, come under attack by a third party. That was the most explicit uh, a, a expression of commitment we have seen from America uh, since, I don't know, the Mutual Defense Treaty was signed, and, or at least since the South China Sea disputes have become so heightened. So I think that was a huge ramp up in American commitment. That's why I really paid attention to the Pompeo statement. And what really caught my attention was it was not so much the rejection of China's claims, which is nothing new. I think uh, uh, ASEC uh, Steelwell was correct on that, but it's like how it implies that the U.S. is effectively supporting the Philippines' claim, for instance, to the Mischief Reef and Second Thomas Shoal as an extension of the Philippine continental shelf, right? So definitely for me, I mean, if you really push it, it seems that statement will have certain operational implications, particularly in terms of what are gonna be the contingency plans uh, in terms of the uh, application of the Mutual Defense Treaty if China engages in any provocative action, whether reclamation in the Scarborough Shoal as part of creating the sprawling network to uh, effectuate an ADIZ or ejecting the Filipino troops aggressively uh, from the second Thomas Shoal or other land features in this practice that we control. So I was not surprised that Secretary Lorenzana actually released a statement in support of the Pompeii statement 
just a few hours ago. And it was very positively and very supportive. So I think the Philippine Armed Forces is also carefully looking at what are going to be the operational implications of this with the question of the MDT. And, and on the last issue, on the issue of ASEAN, I mean, kudos to Vietnam uh, that despite all of the uh, constraints that we are facing right now, I mean, it's really hard to have informal, you know, body body talk over, <laughs> over uh, Zoom or webinar, uh, not to mention their concerns about privacy and everything like that. But if you look at the statement that came out of ASEAN, the latest ASEAN statement on the South China Sea issue, I think this is the first time where we see that the ASEAN made it very clear that only UNCLOS will be the sole legal basis for the resolution and management of the disputes. And this definitely will spill over into the modalities for the negotiation of the code of conduct. Because you see, when it comes to code of conduct, there's so much vagueness about it that's, that I think no one in his right mind believes that this will be finished by next year. Or even last year, we would have thought that it will be finished by, by next year. But I think now at least the ASEAN has made its part very clear that if there's going to be any legally binding nature to the COC, if we're going to talk about any legal reference, it's going to be on clause. And increasingly, if you look at the statements and nota verbale of Indonesia to the United Nations, if you look at now Vietnam even threatening uh, arbitration against China, even from some statements from Malaysia, particularly their extended continental shelf submission last December, it seems finally we're seeing the ASEAN doing, or at least key members within the ASEAN doing what they were supposed to do back in 2016. So I, I got to know Ambassador Stilwell when I, I, I read his statement about praising how Vietnam is so brave and standing up, you know, to China and all of that. But hello, like the Philippines was the one who initiated this arbitration. And actually we were completely isolated back in the days. Greg knows it. We were not getting much love from ASEAN, not even probably from the Obama administration. Now it's good that Vietnam and others are speaking out. And I think we need more of that. And we need to go beyond ASEAN. I think the ASEAN plus is really a mini lateral approach whereby you have key countries like Indonesia, like Malaysia, Philippines, and Vietnam getting their act together. And probably instead of wasting our time on code of conduct, which is not going anywhere with China, I doubt it will go anywhere. Let's look at uh, settling our boundaries uh, based on the on plus, based on the Philippine arbitration award, or perhaps even negotiating our own form of COC. And that will also uh, spill over into broader discussions about Quad. You know, Quad, it seems to be alive and kicking, but it cannot just be a counter alliance against China. It should be also about helping certain key countries within ASEAN to develop their uh, requisite capabilities to stand their ground and defend their legitimate interests. So I'll keep it there before I say more controversial things. So it's been a long 13, 14 hours today, thanks to Secretary Pompeo's statement. So I'll keep it there. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Richard. Well, let's, let's uh, keep the controversy going for the rest of the discussion. It makes for good Zoom TV. Uh, let me throw it next to uh, Nong Hong. Nong, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brad. Thanks for the invitation back to the series of conference on the South China Sea. I'm happy to share some observations. For the last two years, I have been uh, very naively thinking that the South China Sea has been developing or will continue to develop on the constructive and positive paths, resuming the cooperation despite some uncertainty in this region. But I was proved so wrong. The situation this year gets even worse, as we heard. And 2020 will be or has been a turning point and transitional period from stability to more uncertainty and even turbulence in these regions. First of all, among the claimant states, we see this unilateral action, reaction, and action cycle from the claimants who attempt to maximize their interest trigger and undermine the regional efforts since July 2016 when China has been working very hard with ASEAN and with relevant states to resume the cooperation and confidence building and to resume the bilateral relations. This unilateral action, from my observation, some of them with very clear political agenda, some with the purpose of the public campaign purposes, and some with legal move. So while China has, has certainly not uh, backed down in terms of protecting its interests, other states, for example, Vietnam and Malaysia has been just as fierce and aggressive in pursuing their narrow interests. In addition, I have just mentioned that extra regional powers increase engagement or intervention will influence the regional political environment in this region, which I think is not conducive for regional stability and cooperations. 
And having said that, I think the most critical and most challenging factor is the U.S.-China relations in maritime domain, particularly in the South China Sea, are getting more tense at a time of general breakdown on over, over U.S.-China competition and relations. The statement made by the Department of State um, yesterday on U.S. position on maritime claims in the South China Sea indicated that the U.S. has completely changed its own policy since 1990s of not taking sides of the South China Sea territory disputes. I was not surprised, but I was very disappointed, I have to say that. And many of the accusations is not legally or factually solid. I can spend hours and hours to um, argue point by point, but I'm not going to do to waste my time. Uh, just one example, in the dispute water in the South China Sea, in the dispute waters, among the more than 1,000 wells, there's not a single one owned or operated by China. Um, I would have to say it were two, uh, the statement made yesterday, to a great extent, were undermined efforts made so far in order to manage this very important and critical bilateral relation between China and the United States, and also put the China ASEAN efforts on confidence buildings in, in risk. I can feel the disappointment from yesterday and frustration from China, not only for the government response, but also from even some Chinese academia who has been working very hard and trying very hard to communicate with the American uh, colleagues in order to bridge the presidential gap between the US and China in maritime domain. So we have seen more than 20 free navigation uh, operations and strong administration in the very sensitive South China Sea waters, especially the most recent, uh, the two aircraft careers uh, drills in the South China Sea, which saw more military uh, muscles from the United States. So how, so in the future, we probably are going to see more joint, uh, US-led joint military exercise um, sales and poor visit and use military base and dispute water with China as a target. At least this is how I understand from a Chinese perspective. So how to clear the hurdles and to achieve peace and stability in the South China Sea? First of all, less public campaign, taking an objective narration on what is really going on in the South China Sea and walk away from the T4 text again. The second, more regional cooperation is to always be encouraged as they have been proved to be a very useful tool for confidence buildings in, in this region to manage the tension and manage the potential and existing conflicts. And third, respect each other. For the claimants, I think continue, you should continue to work on the DOC guidelines and the joint uh, ma uh, maritime cooperation project under DOC and also resuming and continued efforts on discussion and negotiation on the code of conduct. Um, between claimants and non claimants, I would say the coastal states' rights and jurisdiction should be respected on a, a single standard basis. And the user state's legitimate interests, including free navigation, should be also recognized by, by this region. No one has been trying to in, intervene or influence the free navigation in the South China Sea. Um, very importantly, I think it's very uh, to explore the convergence of the of the United States and China in the South China Sea in a border context of maritime domains. So no matter how different that the two countries may have regarding to the policy uh, on maritime issues, the bottom line is not is to avoid instant sea. So on this point, China and the United States should continue to refer to Cues and refer to the two MOU on the rules of behavior, safety of air, and maritime encounter in 2014. And I really want to spend a couple of minutes to talk about the importance of international law. So take a professional understanding and interpretation of international law rather than using the law as a tool to play a public campaign with political agenda. Since July, 20, uh, 2016, the rule of law, rule making are often heard, particularly these days. So putting to the context of the South China Sea, I will argue the absence is actually 
about a long-standing debate on the weight of preference given to different sources of international law. To be more specific, if we talk about the Arctic, we're talking about the interplay of um, relationship of an old treaty and new treaty, such as the 1925 uh, Speed Spreading Treaty and the 1982 Old And in the Arctic, we're talking about the existing treaty, an emerging treaty which is entire good treaty system and the BBNJ negotiation who might have implication in the Antarctica. Uh, in the South China Sea, although there are many important legal issues in this region, such as the islands regime, the major legal issues on the relationship on cross as a treaty law and his so rights as a custom in international law. Very unfortunately, the scope and contemporary relevance of his historic claims were significantly uh, restricted by the arbitrary tribunal, which found that on cross should any previous historical title rights from those uh, recognized only in on cross. I would, I, I would argue that the historical rights should be assessed case by case according to historical particularities and reality of the claim. So what matters most for China and other claimants in the South China Sea is how to balance between the new regimes such as easy stimulated by the conquest of the treaty law and the historical concepts such as the history of water or rights recognized as a custom international law. Well, back to the role of the Law of Sea Convention. So I should compliment the great achievement of the Law of Sea Convention, particularly looking at the three bodies established under it. The Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf and International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea and International Seabed Authority. But having said that, um, the challenges of how to implement or inter, uh, in, in terms of interpretation, the many provisions in OMCROS is also worth noting. First of all, on cross is not universally applicable regime. If we look at the member states which sign and ratify on cross and its two agreements, and some particularly maritime power like the United States has yet to ratify the convention. Second, international law obviously goes beyond on cross. So the on cross act preamble suggests that affirming the matters not regulated by um, on cross continue to be governed by rules and principles of general international law. If we look at the whole text of on cross, in almost 70 of its provisions, on cross refers to the possibility that the subject in question may be governed by another international instrument, either bilateral or regional. If you look at, for instance, the ongoing negotiation on the nature of PBNJ and the polar code in the Arctic, we can see that one cross important, but it's not, it's not the only one that actually play a role in, in, in terms of general ocean governance. My last point about the role in that, of IA2 on cross in the context of the South China Sea, ONCRO was not intended to be comprehensive to the standard, there would be no need to create further law. So the goal of ONCRO is to provide a system of governance rather than to do with very substantive matters, particularly in terms of dispute settlement. About arbitration, I think the arbitration case between the Philippines and China is a test of the efficacy of the dispute settlement, particular compulsory dispute settlement on the ONCRO. The state practices in globally or regionally in this view as management suggest there's no single answer, there's no universal standard on what is the best and what is the approach. So for the future, no matter what approach China might take in certain maritime disputes, whether it's in negotiation or through conciliation or through litigation arbitration, the important principle is the state consent and the mutual respect. So with that, I'd like to uh, close the remark and uh, welcome your question. Thank you. Later. Thank you, Nong. And we will let Dr. Song close us out. Dr. Song? All right. Um, I'll start by, uh, first of all, thanking Greg and uh, CSI for having me in this forum. Um, now, um, the South China Sea uh, for over the past six months has been um, well, uh, affected heavily by uh, COVID-19. And the overarching questions all of us are asking in the region is how is this COVID-19 going to 
uh, impact uh, or affect China's foreign policy, especially in the foreign policy. And a major concern um, has been that uh, China would be uh, taking advantage of the vulnerability of countries in the region in the fight against COVID-19 to push ahead uh, with uh, um, its assertiveness and its presence in the South China Sea. And a number of uh, China's activities in the South China Sea early on in the year, um, towards uh, at least March or April, um, will um, confirm this fear from Southeast Asian countries. Later on, the fear of uh, China might be taking advantage of COVID-19 uh, to expand the South China Sea uh, is further expanded into the fear that rising nationalism within China is uh, encouraging China or is, is causing China not only to expand in the South China Sea, but also to all of its periphery. And this is further elaborated by a number of hotspots arising from not only Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, but also India and East China Sea. And so this rising fear in Southeast Asia and, um, and uh, South China Sea coastal state that whether by design or by accident, China is expanding and is increasing its assertiveness in the South China Sea. Now what's noteworthy is that despite knowing this concern and despite South Southeast Asians uh, on a number of occasions raising this fear towards China, China is not doing anything or not doing enough to dissipate the fear in Southeast Asia about its uh, increasing assertiveness in the South China Sea. And that um, is a, the, one of the reasons why you've seen very strong reactions from Southeast Asian countries towards the South China Sea uh, from the beginning of the year. And mo most noteworthy is uh, what I call a notable battle at the UN. You see a number of Southeast Asian countries for the first time, especially Southeast uh, South China Sea coastal states, have been expressing themselves uh, more clearly, uh, explicitly or implicitly aligning themselves with UNCLOS and especially the uh, tribunal's rule, ruling. Um, while the Philippines for, for the first time after three years have been very expressively um, supportive, uh, reviving literally the tribunal's ruling. We've seen Indonesia, uh, despite being a non-claiming state, have also, has also repeatedly uh, recall the tribunal uh, rulings um, um, and, uh, and, and interpret that into uh, the South China Sea context. You've seen Malaysia and Vietnam, despite not explicitly stating the tribunal's ruling, but have staged their claims in agreement with the tribunal's ruling. Uh, we've seen even Singapore um, have, uh, ex have, have uh, recalled the tribunal's ruling in its uh, defense ministers at uh, the Munich uh, Security Conference early in the year. And later on, um, uh, Singapore has been facilitating uh, the tribunals, uh, the law of the sea tribunals by facilitating uh, or by servicing it should it decides to, uh, to operate in the region. So a number of countries are finding their own way to align themselves with the law of the sea and with the tribunal ruling. And that is very significant uh, and that leads, of course, naturally to the ASEAN statement, ASEAN summit uh, statement, uh, for the first time reiterating uh, UNCLOS as the sole basis for um, uh, the maritime entitlement of countries in the region, as, as Richard earlier pointed out. This is a, a very major development in uh, Southeast Asia's attitude towards uh, the law of the sea, as well as the South China Sea. And I would say a very important milestone in, uh, in, in uh, how, despite how you judge uh, ASEAN's uh, statements or attitudes towards the South China Sea. Now this comes the US position on the South China Sea. We've seen the US for the first time submitting uh, or expressing its position clearly uh, to the UN by its diplomatic notes to, uh, to the new UN uh, earlier in the month. And then you've seen uh, Mr. Pompeo's statement uh, last night and now, just now, uh, Mr. David Stilwell. I think the US statement uh, in support of UNCLOS um, and the tribunal's ruling is significant in that it shows how countries uh, can support the rules-based order. And that is by clarifying their position, their views on what 
constitute compliance to the law of the sea and what constitute violation of the law of the sea. And that's how you go about and realize a rules-based order that everybody has been talking about. And another significance in, the, in Mr. Pompeo's statement yesterday is, is to show that how even a non-state party to uh, the law of the sea uh, can go about supporting it and can support its uh, enforcement. And that speaks loudly and volumely about how uh, state parties' uh, uh, well, uh, responsibility and obligations uh, with regard to its compliance. Now, um, I don't see this as a major shift in U.S. policy. Um, the U.S. policy towards the South China Sea has remained within the direction that uh, it stated in, uh, in 2016. Um, nevertheless, uh, a lot of elements of it has been clarified. And uh, the U.S. has also, uh, for the first time, clarified uh, um, its intention on what it's going to do uh, to enforce uh, its position and enforce the law of the sea. So I hope that this uh, statement by the U.S. is going to um, well um, encourage or is going to give confidence to other countries who uh, uh, are is also in support of the rules-based order and uh, also uh, give ASEAN the confidence to invest on the rules-based order and to continue to uh, put effort into supporting the law of the sea and enforcing it. So uh, in the interest of time, let me just stop there and welcome any uh, Q&A. Thank you, Sean. Um, we are going to be able to run a little bit over time because uh, Assistant Secretary Stillwell's keynote ran a little over. So we have probably 25 minutes to go through questions. I'm gonna try to pick out questions for each of, of the speakers and, and space them out a little bit. If anybody wants to add more questions to the Q&A, again, I just reiterate, please tell us your name and your organization so we know who we're responding to. So let's start with one uh, from Brent Sadler at Heritage Foundation for Nong. Brent asks, what does mutual respect look like concerning issues in the South China Sea? Mutual respect, because I think everyone has its national interest in the South China Sea either it's China or Vietnam and Malaysia. So it's not wrong to protect or pursue your national interests. So among the climates in China, for instance, from a Chinese perspective, we're expecting other climates to recognize China's historical evidence, for instance, in terms of historical fishing rights. And you also respect the countries to not to work in, you know, with other external regional powers Given the fact China is very sincere, we hope to resume bilateral relations, for instance, with Vietnam and with Philippines, and working with ASEAN. Because in the past several years, and everyone's pushing China to speed up the, the process of COC. So when China make a judgment that we will, we will try our best to end the COC and make it happen in three years' time, now we're seeing a lot of pressures, not only from extra regional power, also from our, our, our colleagues and our friends in Asia and other claimants. And their mutual respect between China and other, for instance, picking the United States as one example, to analyze two very important uh, coastal states and usually states. For, for China, China respects the United States to take a neutral position as always. And then from the United States perspective, I believe the China would like to recognize that you have legitimate interest in the region in terms of navigation. But we have to admit that we have different legal interpretation on what is, for instance, intelligence gathering, etc. And this is an ongoing debate for ages. And we all know that we are, we are taking very different legal position on that. But I have to say that even though the United States is increasing its frequency of free navigation, in the South China Sea. So every time when China will, will launch diplomatic protests, but I think the professionalism has to be emphasized from both China and the United States. So even they are selling, uh, for instance, to, um, to argue against each other, but they are taking the navies and coast that they can very professional uh, principle according to the cues. Okay. Uh, let me, 
play off of that for a question to both Richard and, and Son. We have a question from uh, Carvanen, which uh, basically is, will there be uh, any possibility of joint development uh, deals in the South China Sea? And we've, this debate has been playing out for years, but especially since uh, July 2016 and, and in the Philippine context with President Duterte asking uh, President Xi, that seems to have faded. I don't hear a whole lot of talk about this. I mean, mutual respect would imply a possibility of some kind of joint resource development. Do you see that still being feasible? Richard, maybe you want to start? Yeah, uh, I wrote an article about that, I think, a few weeks ago about uh, the Philippine Department of Energy and Department of Foreign Affairs are looking at probably the Philippines just going forward unilaterally with developing certain areas that were initially kind of cordoned off for potential joint development with China because, you know, as I've been writing forever, right, it's close to impossible to harmonize the Philippines constitution, the Chinese claims in the area and the arbitration award. I mean, there was just, it's, it's you know, in economics, there's a t term called impossible trinity, right? And I think it, you, it could have gone a situation whereby the Philippines would have violated its own initiated arbitration. And with now the Philippine government finally, after four years under Duterte, uh, really bringing down the gauntlet and saying that this is final and binding and that China has to comply with it, I don't see how they're gonna work around that. And I don't think President Duterte has the time to change the constitution, which he was hoping to do earlier right now. They have passed certain executive orders in order to make it easier for us to do something like a JDA minus, you know, some other kinds of exploration activities and all, but I think it's just a tinderbox. It's a legal and political tinderbox. A year from now, the Philippine election is gonna start. This morning, we had a conference whereby the latest SWS survey came out and it looks really bad for China and it looks bad for anyone who's pro-China in the Philippines. I mean, the vast majority of Filipinos are blaming China for the COVID-19. They want accountability on that. And even larger number of Filipinos want the government to take a tougher stance in the South China Sea. This is just a political reality right now. Now, the JDA would have been very important. And I think President Xi Jinping was hoping to sign something concrete back in November 2018. But there was so much pushback internally with the, within the Department of Foreign Affairs. You had no less than Foreign Secretary Luxin coming out and saying, there were some pro-China guy pushing us to sign something. Guess what? We're not going to do it. So, you know, they were taking the issue out into the public, right, in order to embarrass the more China-friendly uh, um, elements within the government. Now, that would have been important if China really signed some sort of a preliminary agreement to a JDA because my sense was since the Philippines is also overseeing the ASEAN China uh, negotiations, particularly the code of conduct as the China ASEAN co country coordinator, I think the two could have been tied because it would have been easy for China to say, hey, look at it, us and the Philippines who had all of this arbitration award, we solve our problems harmoniously through this joint development agreement. Maybe this is a, pl this is a model for the rest of the ASEAN when we negotiate the code of conduct. That possibility seems to be out of the um, out of the window right now. So I think, so it seems our skepticism had some basis, but then again, you can have a plot twist next year if the Philippine government gets desperate and wants to sell out everything to raise funds to deal with the economic hemorrhage. But, but so far, it seems our, our, our prognostics have proven correct that the, the obstacles, legal and political, would be just too much for even someone like Duterte to climb. So on, it, it's been complicated in the Vietnamese context with not only do you have the standoff over Rosneft last year, you had Malaysian drilling in waters also claimed by Vietnam through the 2009 extended continental shelf. Is there any possibility in your pr perspective of Hanoi forging ahead with some kind of joint development deal? Well, it's, uh, it's not a question of if, it's a question of how and where. Um, Vietnam has never ruled out joint development as a possible um, way out uh, for the South China Sea dispute. And it is obliged to, uh, by UNCLOS, to come into provisional arrangements where uh, there's overlapping claims. Uh, but it's, it's the question of how. How do you want to define the area where to join, uh, join the developed resources? If China consists, uh, insists on its position that the sovereign is mine and let's go and jointly develop the resources, then that would be a con condition that uh, Vietnam is never going to accept. So we have uh, uh, been uh, keeping an open attitude towards joint development and uh, try to identify the area uh, with China for possible joint development project. And that area for, in our part has to be a really disputed area where 
the really disputed area means that it is defined um, under UNCLOS as, as a legitimate area of claims under UNCLOS. And if uh, there is an overlapping uh, in the claims there, then that could be a possible area of, uh, of joint development. But if China has uh, no uh, legitimate claims in the area, then that is not a legitimate area for entering into joint development. In fact, uh, Vietnam and China has uh, uh, gone into a very uh, well fruitful um, development, joint development project in the Gulf of Tonkin. And that is because uh, both are based on uh, legitimate rights uh, based on UNCLOS. Uh, Vietnam has also gone into joint development successfully with Malaysia and that's because it's based on UNCLOS. So we just find, uh, try to uh, come to the same approach with China, but unfortunately so far we have not been successful. Thanks, Song. Uh, let me come back to Nong. We, we have a whole series of questions from Henry Bensorto, who is a friend of many on the call, I'm sure. Henry was, was uh, recently uh, it, the Consul General for the Philippines in San Francisco. Before that, he led the West Philippine Sea Task Force in the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, I'm going to crystallize a lot of Henry's legal arguments, if he doesn't mind, and basically ask Nong, we all know that China's interpretations of these issues, of UNCLOS, of what resources are and are not disputed in the South China Sea is unique. It is not a perspective shared by any of the other claimants or the U.S. or most of the rest of the international community. So given that, how, do, how does China hope to forge ahead with some kind of compromise based on mutual respect when it has this unique interpretation of the law that's not shared by any of the neighbors? Well, thanks question to you, Henry. Um, I recall our uh, time that we argue and um, back in, uh, I think that's in New York University. It's very uh, interesting and um, appreciate the question. In terms of a un uh, unique, you said unique because if we're putting China together with other claimants in the China Sea, our uniqueness because all the because we're talking about uh, true that we recognize we ratify Lobs Convention, but we're also expecting other claimants to look at the importance of other general international customs. This is a failed game in terms of respecting each other. When China ratified the Lobs Convention, we recognize the EZ regimes. True, but we also, even though when China uh, back in, uh, when China have a cons clear consideration, we aware that after ratifying Love's Convention, our claims in the South China Sea will be uh, will be influenced. But still, China is working very hard to make many international legislation in accordance with international law. But in terms of uniqueness, we're talking about a balanced game. So we recognize it easy, but we're also expecting other claimants who share similar claims there because they only used easy on their own cause as the legal basis and they tend to forget about the historical customs or historical evidence or custom because they will get more from the easy. But for China's perspective, we're going to lose more if we only base our claims on purely the easy. And we're expecting all the countries to compare these two sources of international law, the treaty law and the customs. So this is when I say this is a unique, uh, the respecting each other. So uh, in the future, I think, it's, again, it's back to the interplay between China and climate state. When we're talking about how to resolve these issues, I still think that's extra regional powers influence does not serve to achieve to achieve this peace and stability in this region. So um, for Henry's question, certainly I can spend a lot of time to argue why China does not uh, agree to this situation, looking at the uh, jurisdiction issue and misbehavior issues and merit issues, and even on the Article 298. I think the United States will probably will stand by China when in the future when we ratify a law convention, it actually will consider the possibility of making a separate declaration not to uh, in accordance with Article 298 to avoid any possibility that we're going to be sued by another claimant in many of its very sensitive issues such as territory and maritime delimitations. Thanks, Nong. I think what I'm going to do is uh, leave 
a few minutes at the end where I'll let each of the panelists respond to anything else they've heard. Um, and that way we can keep rolling through as much of the queue as we can. But, you know, if, as I see Richard jotting notes, if anybody wants to jump in at the end and respond to each other, we'll, we'll leave time for that. So let's go to, to Dr. Son again. Uh, we have a question from Jeannie Zhao Wen who asks, would Vietnam take China to the ICJ? I assume we can also include any of the other options for arbitration under uh, Article 7 of UNCLOS. Uh, and would Vietnam step up its defense relationship uh, by joining the U.S. and others in a quad plus? Well, Vietnam's policy um, has been to use any peaceful means to resolve uh, its disputes, uh, not only with China, but with anyone. And I assume uh, that would include uh, third party adjudication. Uh, we, in fact, have never ruled out that as a possibility. Uh, we see that as a friendly um, way um, and uh, non-threatening way of uh, resolving uh, maritime disputes and also um, a method of resolving disputes that has become more customary in the context of Asia. We've seen an increasing number of uh, countries uh, which have uh, long-standing uh, maritime disputes going uh, to seek third-party assistance in resolving uh, their maritime disputes. And uh, we thought that that could be a way uh, of assisting uh, us to resolve uh, difficult maritime disputes with, uh, with other countries, including China as well. So uh, that stands as a possibility, but whether uh, we are going to use it, uh, when we are going to use it, uh, it's, it's uh, um, well, a political decision that I'm not able to answer. Uh, whether we will enter into uh, defense cooperation with other countries in the region, why not? Um, well, defense cooperation uh, with countries in the region is, um, is, is a normal thing. Uh, and Southeast Asian countries uh, have been cooperating with uh, Japan, with Australia, with the US, much more ahead of Vietnam. And so uh, Vietnam uh, see that as a, as a viable option as well. And uh, now the, uh, the thing is, uh, Vietnam prefers to enter into cooperation uh, in a multilateral context and uh, for uh, peaceful reasons. And that is to uh, well, support uh, the capacity building and the capacity is to enforce law and not against any country. So uh, I leave it as a possibility and um, well, a thing that is customarily done in, in the ASEAN context as well. Thanks, Son. Let's, uh, let's head to Richard for the next question from Michael Anderson. You talked a bit about the state of, of U.S. Philippine military cooperation and the, the suspension of the abrogation of the uh, visiting forces agreement. Where do you see things going from here? Is there now agreement within the Duterte government on these issues? What happens with the VFA, what, five months from now when the, the suspension would restart again, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, one of the greatest ironies, again, of many ironies of the Duterte administration is that actually under the Duterte administration, we have had the most number of joint military activities with the Americans. In fact, within the whole Indo-Pacific Command, it's the Philippines with which the U.S. has the most number of joint activities. Last time I checked based on the Indo-Pacific paper, and in fact, this year we're hoping to have I think 300 joint exercises or activities. Unfortunately, a lot of them are going to be affected, but one area that I think we're more and more focusing on is uh, looking at the revised guidelines for our mutual defense treaty and particularly looking at non-traditional security and gray zone threats that we're facing in the South China. So I think uh, not many of us are worried whether people in the government or outside strategists worried about uh, the prospect of large scale warfare. Although the Philippines is also developing its naval capabilities kudos to the Duterte administration, it has continued the, the Horizon 1, now we are the Horizon 2 acquisition of modernization. So I think what we're more focused on is the militia threat from China and how can we tweak our guidelines of our alliance to be able to make it more applicable or more even deterring with respect to that threat that is coming from China. I mean, AMT has done a fantastic job of showing that for heaven's sake, for more than a year, those Chinese militia come fishermen, folks have been just surrounding us in the waters, but gladly, again, the good thing about the third administration is we're doing something on the ground. Uh, we are developing finally our airstrip and capabilities there, and our defense secretary has visited the area at least twice over the past three years, which I think is quite unprecedented, again, in decades, to give credit to the administration beyond what the president says. 
But I think one thing that I'm a little bit worried about is watching in the Himalayas, and this is what I ask our Indian friends, uh, you know, one fear I have is the possibility for what they call short, sharp war. You know, this kind of a uh, quick, you know, shock and awe, skirmishes, maybe a few dozen die, but China immediately imposes its will, and then the status quo will shift in China's favor. And in Himalayas, we saw that how China, within a matter of days and weeks, was changing the status quo vis-a-vis -vis India, and unfortunately, that led to skirmishes. So our fear is that you know, if they can do that to India, which is a nuclear power, what will stop them from engaging in short, sharp war, especially if China chooses to go and move forward with reclaiming the Scarborough Shoal or do something more aggressive like declaring an ADIZ across the area as they have finalized their, their, uh, their militarization of the uh, land features in the South China Sea. But of course, on the sidelines, we're also looking at counterterrorism cooperation. I think counterterrorism cooperation has been better than ever. And now with the Philippines passing this very draconian anti-terror law, which is kind of came just right after the Hong Kong one, uh, national security law, it gives a lot of leeway to the Philippine military to do preventive detention, to do more war tapping. So I think this is where the alliance with the United States becomes more important because we want smart counterterrorism. We don't want our armed forces to use the big hammer of a more you know, relaxed or kind of lax restrictions on apprehension and detention and war tapping to abuse it. So I think this is where our alliance with the U.S. becomes more important because we want a targeted, smart, and a human rights-oriented kind of, of, of counterterrorism effort. And kudos to the Philippine Armed Forces, as much as possible, they kept their hands clean from Duterte's very dirty drug war, which has yet to catch a single big fish as far as I'm concerned, yeah. Thanks. Uh, we've only got time for maybe a couple more rounds of questions. So let me throw the next set open to the whole group. Um, first, I'll combine questions that we have here from Jessica Abelitz and another that I've misplaced. Uh, basically, what is the role of Australia and Japan here? What role should Australia and should Japan and presumably other middle powers play uh, in either you know, pushing cooperation or coordinating a stronger response in the South China Sea? Anybody who wants to start. Song, please. All right. Okay, I think it's uh, the role of the middle, so-called middle power in the region is to provide stability to the rules-based order. Uh, I've been insisting this on for a long time. It's um, Australia, it's Japan's, and it's India's role to speak out and to uh, to air their views about what they uh, view as a desirable uh, rules to uh, uh, to play in the region and how that should apply in the various contexts of the region. Um, they, their role is also to support uh, countries in the region to build their capacity to um, enforce their own rules uh, and to support the rules-based order, um, to provide transparency uh, in the region and to uh, remove uh, ambiguity as to uh, the rising, uh, which is becoming a rising feature of the post-COVID-19 uh, world. So um, I think the major powers in, in, the, in the world of um, major powers rivalry, I think that the middle power uh, has a very critical and important role to play. And it's time for now to come up and, and uh, play that role. Thank you. Anybody else want to jump in? Oh, Greg, maybe I'll just also more or less end on this because we have the end notes and all. Um, well, on the Australia thing, remember that aside from the United States, the only other country that has a significant defense agreement with the Philippines is not Japan. China has not signed any, despite all of the good talks of President Duterte towards China, but it's actually Australia. They have a status of forces agreement that has been ratified by the Philippine Senate. And it was very uh, ably and I think uh, smartly used during the Marawi operation. So we saw how far the Philippine-Australia relations could go. And, you know, some Filipino soldiers would perhaps joke that, you know, the Aussies are even cooler than the Americans sometimes to deal with, so they prefer to do their studies there. I think even the Philippine Defense Secretary, he did some studies there in, uh, in Australia, among others. But on maritime security, we see Australians getting more involved in terms of being more or less permanent observers in Balikatan exercises and all. We see the, Ameri uh, the Australians probably are going to be more active in the South China Sea, Perhaps we're going to look at multilateral phone up something that Admiral Harris has been calling for for quite some time. Maybe we saw that already in the case of uh, the nearby Malaysia joint patrols by Americans and the Australians. But with the Philippines, we're not, I'm not seeing as much direct 
you know, maritime security cooperation, uh, you know, in, in ways that is commensurate to the potential of this alliance. So I think, you know, everyone talks about quad and trilateral, but, you know, Philippines is an ally of US, Australia is an ally of US, but much has not has been happening between the two. So I think we can really move forward on that. And just to end, uh, end my notes, uh, I think in the ASEAN, I think the cult of the COC has been more of a minus than, than a plus for the ASEAN. I think it has given China a cover to say they're doing something about this and everything is stable and we're improving, but obviously not much is really changing and we're just moving in circles and more confusions. I think what is more important is what Secretary uh, Del Rosario put forward back in 2014-15, which was the triple freeze. There's no point in negotiating about territory or maritime uh, disputes uh, or even managing those disputes if one country is really changing the facts on the ground like crazy, right? And what Vietnam is doing in terms of reclamation and militarization is nothing compared to what China is doing, which is like NBA level compared to what uh, Vietnam is doing. What we need is a freeze on further militarization, on further aggressive naval exercises, on further provocative action by paramilitary forces, uh, militia forces. I think that is what the ASEAN should really focus on freezing the situation first before we can properly talking about the rules of the road or even ambitiously illegally binding code of conduct. So I think it's impossible to talk about the code of conduct or legally binding code of conduct while the facts on the ground are changing on a daily basis at the expense of smaller countries. And the last thing, I, you know, in my I think latest piece in AMTI, I said there is resistance, but it's divided resistance. There's a pushback, but there's no center of gravity. Uh, I think the Pompeo statement is creating some sort of parameters of how the U.S. could be more helpful in ways that it was not. But to be frank, I think a lot of us in the region, I think a lot in the U.S. and D.C. perhaps are looking forward to an administration after November, whether it's a revamped Trump administration or Biden administration, that doesn't just go out and say China is evil, let's not talk to them, they're horrible people. That doesn't work because a lot of us China is our neighbor. It's like family. You cannot choose them. You have to deal with them. And China is also giving us a lot of benefits that the U.S. cannot provide us economically, socially, and otherwise. So I think the U.S. has to be realistic. And I think hopefully, ne come next year, the U.S. is going to have a kind of leadership that galvanizes the region in a way whereby we're not creating a counter coalition, but more like a coalition of constrainment on China, a coalition of deterrence, rather than a new Cold War, which is not really working. And within ASEAN, I think it's extremely important that Indonesia continues to do what it has, it has been doing for the past few months. The SBY administration, uh, you know, back in the days, did a fantastic job of making sure that Cambodia did not mess up ASEAN as they tried to do it back in 2012 to China's benefit. Kudus to Marti and a lot of top Indonesian diplomats. With uh, Mr. Jokowi, we saw kind of a mayor president, just like President Duterte, was so focused on domestic development he was really looking down at summits, looking, calling it summit diplomacy and thinking it's an ego trip. But I think finally, uh, Indonesia is realizing that, you know, even if you're not interested in geopolitics, geopolitics is interested in you. And what's happening in Natuna has been a wake up call. And I think there's enough bottom up pressure on Indonesian government to take the kind of tough stance that we're looking for. So I'm, I'm, I was very, very encouraged by Marsudi's statements in ASEAN recently and how she just brutally invoked the Philippine Arbitration Awards in ways that I think shamed the Philippine government for not doing that, considering that we initiated this arbitration. So I think, interestingly, the finally the Philippines is catching up with what the ASEAN countries were supposed to do back in 2016. So it's a quite a circuitous strategic situation, but I think we're finally moving in the right direction. But we need a center of gravity within the ASEAN. I think Indonesia will play a great job, and also internationally, with an America that is more less confrontational in the way it is right now and more inspirational in the way it should be, hopefully after November. Thanks. Uh, Nong, do you have a couple minute closing? It is not closing. I'm about to respond. I want to share what is really in China's mind in terms of how, what is the role for Japan, Australia, and the South China Sea, depending on how you narrate, how to picture the agenda from Japan or Australia. Certainly, if we are talking about um, Australia and Japan's input in terms of capacity building to enhance the non-traditional maritime security in the region, then this is very helpful. Uh, but also from China, I think China is welcoming any uh, input from capacity building, given that it's also helping um, organizing a lot of training with putting, uh, inviting all these coastal 
from Philippines for the in terms of training and um, mobilize a lot of discussion in terms of maritime security enhancing for that particular purpose. I think Japan or Australia or other middle powers role is welcome. But putting into another, another token, if you picture the agenda or purpose of Japan, Australia's engagement in this region is talking in China, is enhancing its partnership with, for instance, with Vietnam, with Indonesia, with the attack, with China is attacking. That is the very concern for China. And also, I think I want to also emphasize the importance of putting a very objective narration. For instance, in the statement yesterday, when you're talking about uh, China's so-called uh, unlawful activity in other countries, in the day, I have to point to a fact that there's no a clear boundary in the South China Sea. We're talking about a particular country's plan in the day, which is still pending. So I think that's what led to um, end of my remark, to be more objective and in a more taking a break, um, single standard narration about many of the legal and political issues. Thanks, Song. Uh, Song, did you have any final word? Well, um, uh, throughout the day, I don't hear any objections to ASEAN service to the region. And in two weeks' time, we are going to have the ASEAN Regional Forum, uh, the ASEAN uh, well, meeting, and so on and so forth. So I hope that everybody is going to come into the ASEAN gathering, whether online, it's most likely it's going to be online, in support of ASEAN. And in particular, if uh, everyone can support ASEAN's achievement in its latest chairman statement on uh, the part of uh, recognition of UNCLOS um, as, as, uh, as an important role to play uh, in um, uh, setting the order in the South China Sea, then give ASEAN that support and adopt it as an ASEAN regional forum statement or East Asia forum uh, statement. That would be um, a, a very a solid support to ASEAN and also to multilateralism and to the rule of law in the region. So I call on everybody's support to ASEAN uh, in the upcoming uh, meeting. So let me conclude there. Thanks. Well, uh, that should be about it. It's almost 11 p.m. for Richard. It's almost 10 p.m. for Son. And I think Nong and I both probably need more coffee here on the East Coast. So thanks to everybody who showed up. We still have more people on this call than could have fit into the conference room at CSIS. So I call that a success. Uh, and we will have this video cleaned up and posted within a day or two on CSS.org and YouTube. So thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Nong Bye, Richard. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.